Of course, now it pops up for me. All right, still say okay, yeah. So I said we're good. We're on. We are. We're on. All Let's right, Hit the recording. Okay. Very good, and good evening, everyone, and Emerging Revolutionary War followers. This is Kevin Pollock with Emerging Revolutionary War uh, with the next issue of our Rev War Revelry that we do every other Sunday uh, at 7 p.m., so thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, before we get into our topic for the evening, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for a couple of our future Rev War Revelries in a couple of weeks, that will be Sunday, two Sundays from now. Um, pull out your schedules, but um, I believe it's June 13th. Uh, we'll have um, Billy Griffith, one of our historians with ERW, um, talking about Velcor Island uh, with one of his guests. And uh, so stay tuned for that and follow us on Emerging Revolutionary War on Facebook and EmergingRevolutionaryWar.org for further information about that. So we were joking tonight, uh, myself and the guests that I'll get to in just a second, that we are... Um, going to be rebranding Emerging Revolutionary War just for the evening for the next hour and we are now Emerging War of 1812 um, which will be uh, uh, I think a, a grand following I think this is only the second War of 1812 Rev War Revelry which sounds odd to say uh, that we have ever done so this will be a fun one and tonight of course we will be focusing on the Chesapeake campaign of 1814 but as you'll find out it extends much uh, more before 1814 uh, as well so I'll introduce our panel of speakers tonight uh, to my uh, left on the screen is Nathan McDonald a longtime friend uh, of mine and uh, really encyclopedia of everything related to history so that's why he's here to keep us in check uh, Nate uh, is a um, Historic Site Interpreter at uh, Ripon Lodge in Prince William County. So Nate, thank you for joining us this evening. Happy to be here, uh, thanks Kevin. Sure, caddy corner to me is uh, George Best, who I once believed when I worked with both Nate and George at Harper's Ferry <laughs> Brothers, but in fact they are not. Uh, <laughs> George had a beard back then too, so it looked much more like he, uh, they were brothers, but I was wrong. But George is a War of 1812 historian extraordinaire and also a park ranger at Harpers Ferry National Historical Park. So thank you for joining us tonight, George. Happy to be here. And uh, because we are talking about the Chesapeake campaign tonight and the state of Maryland, uh, and neither George, Nate, nor myself are reared from the state of Maryland originally, we had to bring on our token Marylander uh, here tonight to spice everything up with Old Bay and Natty Bow when necessary. And uh, so that is one of the uh, co-founders of Emerging Revolutionary War, uh, Philip S. Greenwald. I'm going to use your official title, Phil, and uh, get us into the Chesapeake campaign. So, Phil, thanks for making this about Maryland tonight. Oh, anytime. Any, if, even if we go to the War of 1812, I'll find a way to make it all about Baltimore and, uh, and Maryland in, the, uh, in some type of military history. Nathan, I, mean, I think you've been challenged. I think we now need to conquer back with Virginia. <laughs> We can work yeah. on that. That's all right. I'm all for that. Chesapeake Bay runs through both. You know, it's not just Maryland. So no, we, don't get we too all carried away. <laughs> Rainy Island. All right. So speaking of Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay, we are going to go ahead and get right into it. Uh, and we have just an hour here. I will also mention too, if you do have any questions or comments that you'd like us to address, uh, feel free to enter those into the comments on the, uh, the Facebook live feed, and we'll be happy to get to those as best as we can. Phil's helping me out tonight in monitoring uh, some of those questions for us. But the first question that I, I really wanted to get to is really why the Chesapeake Bay? Why does the Chesapeake Bay become a target of the British Army, really beginning in 1813, uh, not 1814, which will be the topic of our conversation tonight? So whoever would like to go ahead and tackle that first, you're welcome to have that. All right. Well, Kevin, I'm actually going to make one correction for you. It's the British Navy that goes in first, not the Army. They fair, come in later. Fair. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, George, you've been booted off. Bye. Yeah, off. Bye. <laughs> uh, but go ahead. But anyhow, to actually answer your question and not be a smart aleck. Um, so, well, the big, uh, there are a few reasons, but the big one is to try to make, well, distract the United States to a degree, get soldiers who would otherwise be set up to the Canadian frontier where the British are uh, uh, beating back uh, several, uh, well, frankly, poorly uh, led uh, invasions of Canada, try to get more of those troops away from the Canadian border to make it easier on the British troops up in Canada. 
Yeah, it is, you know, even uh, by 18, 1813 and 1814, the British have discovered uh, beating the Americans is not enough because uh, they keep doing that and it hasn't ended the war yet. Um, they've, they've been fighting on the Canadian frontier uh, all along the lakes, the rivers, um, and even with some encouragement to the native tribes in the uh, southeast Um so it's it's just yeah it's another opportunity to to bring the war uh, home to the American public, and especially yeah you know what better place than right by the nation's capital, uh, which just so happens to be nice and conveniently located near uh, several large navigable bodies of water. And uh, actually, so Phil, since you're from Baltimore, I'll also add you know there are a lot of uh, privateers coming out of Baltimore and. Uh... British merchants were not too happy with their insurance rates going up with all the privateers going after all their ships. So it was also an opportunity for the British to try to squelch that as best they could and um, just kind of bring that in. Yeah, there are. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Exactly. I mean, you look at uh, what troop, uh, I mean, the British controlled island of Bermuda, which is um, a good staging ground as well. Um, it's also, you're looking at international impacts that uh, will happen. I mean, what's happening in Europe will free up for uh, forces to be reassigned. Um, because I mean, we tend to forget, once again, if you go back to another war, like the French and Indian War, that the British are fighting in other spheres. And they're also fighting in Europe. Um, some small little Frenchman is running amok, and they've got to try to stop him. So uh, when they do that, it obviously frees up troops to, to, to come toward the, and toward the American theater. And so, yeah, there is that eastern seaboard. I mean, if you look at Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, this whole uh, mid-Atlantic is pretty much, I mean, open to uh, navigable rivers, invasion routes, and so forth. Yeah, and, and Phil brings up a great point. Ultimately, fighting on the North American continent is very much a backwater theater. Uh, the British are, are far more concerned, as Phil said, about uh, that, uh, that French gentleman running amok on the continent. Uh, and his his friends in Italy and Spain and Portugal, uh, Russia and the like, and it is uh, it's it is a drain on their manpower. But it, as George also mentioned, it, it's a big drain on the Royal Navy. Uh, it is the largest fleet in the world at the time, but even they have their their limits. Um, Bermuda protecting the West Indies and the the transatlantic trade uh, soaks up a lot of lighter combatants that could be put to good service in the Mediterranean or the, the European coast maintaining their blockades or, uh, or raiding there. Um, and it also soaks up a lot of, of officers, um, competent admirals and such. They, they still need to fill posts uh, for the North Atlantic Station in Halifax and the West Indies, Bermuda. Um, so they, they're hoping that, especially 1813, 1814, if they can uh, they can potentially bring a little bit, a little bit home, uh, the impact of the war close to the American capital, close to the American uh, seat of government that might help um, bring them to terms. They also, we'll probably get into it later, but they, they do enable their military commander in the field, Admiral Warren. Um, they do give him some sort of plenipotentiary powers to make deals with the Americans uh, if he can, but uh, doesn't really work out so great. <laughs> Good. So you guys bring up a lot of good points with why and sort of headed off the next question that I was going to go with, which is good of, of the importance of the Chesapeake, right? I mean, the British could have, have chosen many different places along the Atlantic seaboard to try and distract the, uh, or, or at least draw forces away from the Canadian frontier, American forces away from the Canadian frontier uh, and anywhere throughout the Atlantic seaboard. But of course, with the Chesapeake Bay, you have the importance, as George mentioned, of the, the privateers coming out of Baltimore. You obviously have the symbolic importance of not just Baltimore, but the nation's capital there in the Chesapeake Bay as well. And what we start to find out in 1813 is the Chesapeake Bay is really pointed like an arrow into the heart of this young United States. And you can see, of course, looking at a map of the Chesapeake Bay, all the different rivers and harbors that branch off of it that the British are able to utilize. Uh, to wage a very different style of warfare that you alluded to, Nate, uh, and it becomes sort of a, an uglier uh, side of, of warfare uh, that it, it takes a little while to get to. You're seeing some of it on the Canadian frontier as well. But why do the British decide to really escalate uh, the war in the Chesapeake from what you've seen for the most part along the Canadian frontier in terms of burning uh, villages, going after industry, and of course what we're going to get into in a little bit, and that will be burning the nation's capital. 
uh, Washington, D.C. in 1814. Uh, that's correct. I thought it was George. Yeah. Uh -huh. Go for it, Phil. I mean, the uh, so trying to remember the whole the whole question there that you asked. Um, I mean, it is. Uh, I mean, the the parallels. Obviously, the uh, the British um, are trying to uh, figure out a way. I um, mean, to combat what is happening in the Northern Theater, release pressure as well. I mean, there is some. Uh, we tend to forget that Americans did burn uh, things on the other side of the border. Um, as well. Um, you also, I mean, uh, I think someone put in the comments that, uh, that Baltimore is a nest of pirates that were moved, uh, as George said earlier, they escalated as well. But also, I mean, um, uh, it's a teaching example. I mean, um, coming into Chesapeake, I mean, you see what uh, we'll get, not to prelude too much, but I mean, the, the Americans, we set up what, Fort Washington. Um, even today, if you go to Fort Warburton or Fort Washington, as it's called, the film says this is a fort that nothing's really happened at. I mean, the British come march around it. Um, Bladensburg, I mean, is a um, uh, catastrophe. Um, if you read more about, I mean, the, um, the administration between Madison and Armstrong and Monroe, there's some uh, friction there as well. So it's not a concerted effort. Um, and so, yeah, there is this chance, I mean, to, to teach this upstart um, the United States. I mean, what we forget is that we're not too far removed from the American Revolution and that this is still, there's a lot of unburdened questions that are still going on whether this American experience or example can actually last. And so it's, let's teach these uh, Americans a, a lesson. Well, some of it's also um, the primary subordinate who's doing a lot of the field work for the British in the Chesapeake Bay is George Coburn. Now he's got guys operating above him. Initially it's Admiral John Warren and then later Al Alexander Cochran, right? Yeah, Alexander. Alexander. Yeah, yeah. Cochran. Yeah. And remember, it's Cochran. The first name messes me up. Um, but Coburn's, you know, the the one who's doing a lot of the operating immediately in the Chesapeake. Still reporting back to these guys. Getting he's, he's he's the field guy. Yeah, um, and he is just inherently a very aggressive individual. And you know, he had done an awful lot of uh, cutting out operations, not too different from what he did in the Chesapeake back in Europe. Uh, so this was nothing new to him. Um, and he developed very quickly a huge disdain for Americans that I'm sure just could fed into his willingness to basically pillage and plunder the American coastline as much as he could. And some of it also goes back into that whole, uh, we need to get more American regular soldiers away from the Canadian frontier if we scare enough of the citizens in this area, they'll start demanding them more and they'll start marching south, which of course did not happen, but um, part of it. Yeah, and, and that does, um, I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on the, um, the command issues in a minute. That's part of uh, American disunity is sort of what derails what to the British seem, seems like a very logical plan of, oh, well, they're, they're going to start raiding near our capital. We should, uh, you know, any sensible force would uh, would sort of unify and rally around that and, and recall soldiers to, to protect them. And uh, that doesn't doesn't really happen exactly as they plan. But it is. Um, yeah, I mean, it's they, there's a little bit of a, of a precedent. Uh, the British operations against Philadelphia, of course, uh, utilized the Chesapeake Bay to kind of get close to that inland port and around uh, otherwise fairly tough Delaware River defenses. Um, here, yeah, they, they, the British were aware that this was something of a soft target. They'd been operating off the coast already. Um, they had a little bit of advanced intelligence. They, they knew there was not a whole lot ready uh, in being. There was, um, Kevin mentioned earlier, I'm going to talk a lot about Navy stuff. Uh, I'll try and rein it in a little bit. But they, they knew there were the, the Jefferson era gunboats, uh, a couple dozen of them on the bay and in Baltimore. Um, there was a, a couple of small sailing river uh, schooners, small sailing ships uh, on the Potomac and on the Chesapeake Bay that the Navy had either bought or impressed. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it, it's to, to British strategic planners, it, it seems like a, a great opportunity to get in there um, and, and divert a lot of those forces. But yeah, I don't know if we're, we're getting ahead. Um, oh, go ahead, George. I know. Just kind of adding on to that, you know, something that also leads to this is 
the British, there are cases where the British do get to places where there just aren't any defenses because it is a long defensive line. Again, look back at that map of the Chesapeake Bay. The British get to sit in the middle on the water. They've got naval superiority out, I mean, way, way more superior than anything we could field. Um, and you've got a whole bunch of state and D.C. militia who are supposed to come out for short stints to guard this massive coastline, which, you know, we've talked about all these rivers. Well, the British can just sail up them and just land on the other side or further down or whatever, or anywhere else along the coastline of the Chesapeake Bay. That is a lot of coastline that would require a lot of soldiers. And of course, you know, there's the old military adage. I think it's usually credited to Frederick the Great of like, if you defend everything, you defend nothing. And then, of course, the Americans also don't have soldiers down there, or hardly any professionals to really do much. So there isn't a whole lot of defense. And, and George makes an excellent point, too, uh, on the, the point of affordability for the British. You know, uh, we don't we don't talk a whole lot about the British home front situation, but of course, they're facing a lot of domestic unrest. This war is, by that point, almost 25 years old. Uh, in some form or another between the French Revolutionary Wars, um, the wars with France and the, the Grand Alliance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, trade has been impacted, foreign trade, domestic trade. Um, there's civil unrest. People are increasingly unhappy about being either levied or uh, enlisted in the military, naval impressment. Uh, Britain is very much stewing at home. So the, the British, the Royal Navy and the um, British colonial officer looking at this very much as an expedition that can be mounted to them on a, a fairly budgeted account because you are, at least in the initial stage, stages, using in place Royal Navy assets. And yeah, you know, you're dropping off a couple of, of long boats uh, with 20 or 30 sailors and some Marines that are going to go in and, uh, and torch a plantation, make offs with some goods, uh, potentially liberate some uh, enslaved people or uh, encourage them to join the Colonial Marine Corps, uh, Corps of Colonial Marines, I think it's the other way around. Um, so it is, they're, they're looking at this still as, as very much, at least initially, an operation they can amount, uh, that can mount kind of on a budget. So before we get into the 1814 campaigns, I wanna draw us back. We've talked a lot about why the British so far focus on the Chesapeake, but there is, before we get to what is known as the Chesapeake Campaign of 1814, uh, again, most notably the Battle of Baltimore and Battle of Bladensburg and the burning of Washington. Let's go back to 1813 and what the British do during that time, especially in the southern Chesapeake Bay. So does anyone want to pick up there with uh, British operations closer to on the Virginia shore uh, rather than looking into Maryland? Sorry, Phil. We're moving into Virginia real quick. <laughs> Phil's out of the uh, debate here. <laughs> George, you, you mentioned it. I think you said Craney Island. Yeah. Well, Nate, this is kind of your baby. I'm going to let you have fun with Craney Island. Oh, sure. I'll um, chime in, but your baby, go for it. So February 1813 is kind of the important month, basically. Um, that's when the orders finally reach the, the North American stations um, that the they're supposed to head up to the bay and, and start conducting these operations. Um, all through this period, the... Um, the U.S. Navy has been facing something of a crisis. Uh, I don't, I don't want to cut off anybody's further discussion of it, but uh, the, the briefest elements of it is that the, the cabinet and the president are not really aligned together. Uh, Secretary of War John Armstrong has a very definite view on how he wants the war to be fought and where, and it's not on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't think that the British are doing anything more than trying to distract, um, that they're just gonna burn a few plantations. Uh, it's, it's not really a significant threat. Um, a lot of the naval officers uh, and um, of course locals <laughs> in Baltimore and Alexandria, Norfolk, Hampton are, are all very concerned <laughs> because uh, it is very easy for the British to do what they did during the Revolutionary War and drop in and start burning things and. Uh, and impacting their lives quite directly. Uh, but yeah, the kind of the big events of 1813 are gonna be cent centered lower down on the bay. Um, Craney Island and Hampton are kind of two of the biggest events. Uh, Craney Island results, the British attempt, um, there's several Navy yards on the bay. In addition to all the privateers and the private operations up in Baltimore, 
uh, two of the fledgling U.S. Navy's very important facilities are at Washington and in Norfolk uh, called the Gosport Navy Yard. Uh, one of the only dry docks in the United States will eventually be uh, completed down there to handle large repairs and things like that. So Craney Island uh, is, is, on one hand, it's the best case scenario. <laughs> the Virginia militia, it's a, it's a combined operation between the Virginia militia, the Navy, and the Marine Corps, and Craney Island's a little mud flat <laughs> off uh, up the Elizabeth River from Norfolk. And uh, the British essentially think that they're, they've already had a little bit of experience. They've been raiding a little bit on the bay. They don't have a high opinion of the American militia troops. They've been facing scattered companies maybe a couple hundred guys at a time, um, not necessarily very well armed or very well led, uh, and pretty much been scattering them and doing what they want. So at Craney Island, they kind of expect to do the same thing to eventually uh, continue on up the Elizabeth River, torch the Navy Yard, um, loot Norfolk, potentially burn it again. Um, doesn't go as planned. <laughs> they, they run into a uh, very stout defense at Craney Island between the, the Navy, uh, some volunteer militia company artillerymen and uh, riflemen and Marines on shore in support of them. So the British attempt to make some landings, they get driven off. Uh, embarrassingly, they lose Admiral Warren's personal barge, uh, the centipede. It's very brightly, nicely painted and decorated because he's a, a very highly placed wealthy Admiral. Uh, and that ends up decorating the Gosport Navy Yard and being used by the uh, the US Navy as a, uh, a trophy. Um, so their first big operation, uh, their first big target, try and bump off the Gosport Navy Yard in Norfolk uh, has kind of stalled out. Um, so they, they move on uh, next on the list, Hampton. Uh, however, Hampton does not have the defenses Norfolk had. It does not have a Navy base. It doesn't have the sailors, Marines, uh, volunteer uh, militiamen that Norfolk has had, and without very much of an attempt to stop them, uh, the British walk in and just absolutely burn the heck out of Hampton. <laughs> I mean, uh, the city is is pillaged, looted, everything of value they can carry off uh, goes off. Um, its city is torched. There's all kinds of assaults on the populace. Um, it's it's a terror. Uh, it's it's the worst case scenario. They're back to back within a couple of days of each other, um, and that's going to set up uh, kind of in the consciousness uh, of the public on the bay what this campaign is like. Uh, especially as then they kind of they continue to sort of raid with impunity up the Lower Potomac along the eastern shore of Maryland and Virginia. Uh, again, landing those little parties of of twenty thirty sailors at a time. Yeah, actually, just. Two things I want to add to what Nate said there, just, you know, another goal at Norfolk that they completely failed to get to was the USS Constellation. That was something else they wanted to get their hands on, one of those American super frigates. Uh, they wanted to torch that thing and they couldn't get to it. And then, of course, you know, at Hampton, um, that um, enraged the American populace, just absolutely enraged them. Um, and there were accusations, you know, just not just you know, plunder and burn, earning and assault, but also just plain of like, murder of the citizenry and frankly some cases of uh, rape as well it was ugly it was almost like uh, uh there was a company of uh well originally mostly french but also some french allies who had been captured by the british and were told well you want, want to sit in a pow camp it's very uh moldy and uh, murky and you'll probably die or you can come fight with us and get some little bit of money and not die there and it's just kind of chance on whether a musket ball hits you. And they seem to have been the primary perpetrators of some of the worst atrocities committed at Hampton, but it was, it was not very pretty. And the, the Americans actually just downright have demanded an apology, um, which, you know, you, you know, yeah, you're at war, but this was kind of going beyond the pale. The British just kind of quietly shipped the chasseurs Britanniques, as they're often called just off elsewhere. So they're out of the way. It's also, it is worth noting too, the, the Chasseurs Britannique, they'd been fighting in the Caribbean, um, speaking of the wider scope of the war Britain's fighting. Uh, that's what they'd been enlisted to do, was mainly fight in the Caribbean. Um, and yeah, by that, by the time 
you know, they're fighting in Virginia uh, for at least a brief period of time before they're, uh, it, it's also worth noting too, as George said, you know, their, their performance pretty much shocks the British as well. <laughs> the Royal Navy kind of quickly goes into cover up mode with like, oh boy, uh, <laughs> that did not go well, to put it mildly. So uh, yeah, there is, there is sort of a realization on the British's part, at least initially, that this is, this is a, maybe a little bit too far. Um, a little more than we wanted, but yeah, they they'd been depleted pretty badly. There were not many of them left uh, from their their initial enlistment, and the the standards for recruiting had had dropped a lot. They, it had been filled out like a lot of the um, the British Foreign Service regiments um, had been filled out with a lot of candidates that would have not been taken earlier in the war, um, men that had been disciplinary problems in the French army or in the the prisoner of war camps, um, things like that to just try and basically beef up their forces in the colonies. All right. So we are, we're 27 minutes in and we have just barely touched on 1814, which is okay because the Chesapeake campaign, as I was preparing for this more and more, you do begin to realize that of course the Chesapeake campaign of 1814 that everybody focuses on is really the stage is set in 1813 with everything that happens down at Craney Island and uh, Norfolk and Hampton. But I do want to get us into 1814 a little bit and just set the stage. So we have a different cast of characters a little bit that comes into play. John Warren, the British Admiral in the Chesapeake is replaced as George had mentioned by Alexander Cochran. George Coburn is still going to be a major factor in all of this and we'll uh, touch more on him in just a second. Uh, the um, American military is going to form the 10th military district under the command of William Winder, who is going to play a major role in the defense, if you want to call it that, of Washington, D.C., um, of the nation's capital. Um, but by the summer of 1814, George, George Coburn is back at it, especially in the northern Chesapeake. Uh, he will make nine raids in 25 days in different locations around the northern Chesapeake, keeping the Americans constantly guessing. But finally, uh, the British High Command in the Chesapeake is going to set its sights on Washington and begin moving towards Washington in late August of 1814. Uh, by this point, they've also been reinforced by Robert Ross. We have talked about a little bit how um, the, the British role has changed, or at least has been able to focus a bit more uh, with uh, Napoleon not being as much of a threat anymore uh, over in Europe. And so uh, Ross's men who, who formerly had fought under Wellington in Spain are sent across uh, to America. And so Ross is going to be uh, leading some of the infantry in the action. But uh, George, go ahead and set the stage for us, if you will, the British advance towards Washington and setting up the Battle of Bladensburg on August 24th. Right. So, well, first of all, just kind of like get the scenery, scenery in your mind. Those of you who do live in the mid-Atlantic region, you know what August is like. It is hot, it's muggy, and there are mosquitoes everywhere. And the British um, don't like, and then if you've been to Europe, it's less so like that. And um, not all of these British soldiers had been in Spain, but a fair, some of them had been, and that's what they gotten used to. Also, a lot of them had been stuck on ships for a long time, not exercising a whole lot because it's a big wooden tub. Where are you going to go? And so they're just unloaded at uh, Benedict, Maryland and ordered to march on DC. Um, now, originally, Ross had wanted to just go straight to Baltimore because Washington, D.C. I mean, we you know, today, you know, you hear political commentators kind of refer to Washington as the swamp with its various connotations I don't want to get into. But historically, it was a literal swamp with like water and mosquitoes and nasty things in it um, besides politicians. Um, then the politicians moved in later. So that's but. Coburn, um, now he, of course, he's not in charge, but he exerts a lot of influence. He's able to whisper in enough ears, like, go for DC. He wants the symbolic victory of going after the seat of the American government to um, embarrass James Madison as much as possible. So the British land at Benedict, Maryland, and begin their march toward Washington, DC. It's hot, it's muggy. The soul, and of course, you know, these British soldiers are just you know, slogging through this. So they're pretty miserable going up to this. Meanwhile, the Americans um, are horribly unorganized. Uh, General Winder, who's been placed, as Kevin mentioned, in charge of the 10th Military District, is not a professional soldier, as, which is true of most American officers at the time. They were not professionals. West Point had only turned out so many officers but, uh, by 1814, and most of them were fairly junior. Uh, Winder was chosen mostly because his uncle was the governor of Maryland, 
and he was a Federalist and an opponent of James Madison. There was, so there was, the idea was, hey, we put your nephew in charge. You'll be nice to us now, right? Um, although Governor Winder was taking some measures to try to defend mostly Baltimore, but also areas in his state. Um, but the rules also kind of um, hamstrung General Winder for putting up a defense in that he wasn't allowed to call out the militia for federal duty until there was actually an emergency, which meant he had to wait until the British were actually landing. Then he could start calling large numbers of them to him. So he's getting this kind of somewhat you know, called together at the last minute force from DC, Maryland. There are some troops coming up from Virginia, um, a very small number of regulars, and then the Chesapeake Bay uh, flotilla, which has scuttled its uh, uh, boats and ships and has joined him. So he's got a small cadre of actual professionals, but mostly he's just got thousands of militiamen who have a variety of very plain to overly gaudy uniforms, very limited military training, most of which involved parades and then big barbecues. And he's trying to figure out where the British going to go and uh, where's the best place to stop them. And he ultimately sets up in Bladensburg and then Madison and Monroe come around and start moving troops around for him very helpfully. So that, that's kind of the scenario going into this. You've got professional British soldiers who are hot, tired, and not used to all this, and very disorganized Americans who do outnumber them but don't have any real experience and now have some politicians moving their soldiers around. I like one of the quotes. Blade is, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Phil. I just like one of the quotes uh, from Winder is basically like, take a position at Bladensburg, and if you're attacked, Try to hold out or resist as long as possible. Just, just. Uh, I mean, that's that's words of encouragement there. Um, and also having um, more uh, leaders than uh, men uh, putting in fields. Um, I think Bladensburg is referred to as what the worst debacle in American military history. Um, growing up uh, in Maryland, we just called it the Bladensburg races. Anytime, uh, I think that pretty much actually sums up. But no, I just always thought that quote was great. Just yeah, resist as long as possible. And I mean. Talk about fiery pre-battle speeches. Um, that one does not rank up there in the top ten. Yeah, it's kind of winter as well. Um, George mentioned there's there's some Virginia troops have come north. Um, part of the reason they don't really take part so much in Bladensburg is they don't have flints for their weapons. Um, they they tried to get them, and uh, Winder directed them to to go find somebody at uh, the Washington Arsenal. Uh, they didn't find anyone at the Washington Arsenal. They just kind of uh, were left to uh, their own devices until they ended up getting shuffled over towards Baltimore. But uh, yeah, it's the American command is in chaos. Uh, and yeah, there, there, are, uh, there are two parts of two US regular regiments that are almost all raw recruits, the 36th and 38th. Uh, and they're, they're just, again, show you the chaos. They're not even on the battlefield <laughs> when, uh, when Bladensburg is fought. Oh. So, so we have chaos. Oh, go, go ahead, Phil. I want to throw out something there. I'd read it somewhere and I was trying to find it as I was doing the research for this. There are some designs that Armstrong believed that the Secretary of War had aspirations for higher office and that he didn't think Washington was strategic enough. And that's why he left it undefended. And that, um, and he, is there any truth to that or is that just some author's take on why Armstrong was borderline incompetent? George is looking like he wants to come. <laughs> Hold on. I was going to say, I'll, I'll let George tackle that first. Well, I have my, I have okay, my own well, opinions. Okay, it's been a while since I've dug deep on John Armstrong. Um, so I'm going to be a little weaselly here, but <laughs> I've generally, that's kind of what I've run into as well as Armstrong genuinely did not think they would go after DC because it was a small collection of government buildings with, and it was a swamp. There was no real population center. There was no real commercial district or anything like that. It would be, you know, the real prize is sitting not too far away in Baltimore. That's what the British would go for if they were down here. And then he still insisted keep the troops up in uh, uh, Canada. And Armstrong was also fully convinced of his own uh, military genius. Um, as for aspirations to higher office wouldn't surprise me although I don't remember off the top of my head if he had any or not but again I would not be surprised at all um, he was definitely ambitious um, and actually prior to becoming secretary of war he had been a brigadier general in the U.S. army so he did and actually he had also been a during the revolution uh, 
Nate, correct me if I'm wrong. He was a staff officer for Horatio Gates, wasn't he? Yes, he also was a staff officer for um, Hugh Mercer. But uh, talking about kind of his um, his revolutionary war behavior and sort of kind of going towards um, his motivation, uh, he he was uh, allegedly at least like everything else involved with it involved with the Newburgh conspiracy against Washington and kind of the the Continental Congress structure, not uh, unusual uh, at that stage of the war when people hadn't been paid for years. Um, yeah, like George says, I, I can't really talk to his his motivation for higher office, but he was definitely in that that set of Revolutionary War veterans that were very much convinced that their experience as junior officers and staff officers at that point, in a lot of cases, 30 or 40 years before, uh, made them the ultimate military experts. Um, so whether or not it was uh, it was uh, a part of his goals for higher office, he definitely had the self-assuredness, self-confidence, I'm trying to be polite, <laughs> uh, to to think that, well, I, I know exactly what they're going to do and, uh, and I, I know exactly how to prepare, which is, yeah, this is why are they going to come burn Washington? What What's the, the play here? Um, there's the patent office and then the unfinished White House and Capitol building uh, and the Navy Yard. So all of this, the chaos, the confusion in command, the militia, uh, the expectation amongst uh, the Secretary of War, John Armstrong, that the British weren't even going to go after Washington, D.C., sets up for one of these great American underdog stories, right? where uh, the Battle of Bladensburg is one of the most memorable battles in American history. Not exactly, of course, and as Phil already mentioned, it is referred to as the Battle or the Bladensburg Races, uh, more commonly even than the Battle of Bladensburg. So Ross's troops are able to get their way across the eastern branch of the Potomac River, now known as the Anacostia River, and by the night of August 24th, make their way into Washington, D.C. as the uh, American forces from Bladensburg are fleeing towards Georgetown. But before we get to the burning, does anybody want to mention anything about the battle itself? Any American highlights? Anything to uh, really discuss? George is looking to yeah. chop at the bit. So despite it's being called the Bladensburg Races, I do want to rattle off. Now, these are probably going to vary slightly source to source. These are just the first ones I bumped into. Um, I want to compare the British and American casualties. So the Americans had 10 to 26 killed and 40 to 50 wounded and about uh, 100 were captured. The British, by comparison, had 64 killed and 185 wounded. So they definitely got a bloody nose, despite, you know, it's a decisive victory. There's no arguing that. It is a glorious victory for the British, but they, boy, they had to earn it. Um, they, and, yeah, they don't steamroll right yeah, No, It is generally believed. Um, now, they definitely got, took some casualties crossing the river and fighting the militia before they all scattered to the winds. Um the militia did do ever so slightly better than people give them credit for, but it's not by much. Um, most of them did just turn. And a lot of it had to do with terrible leadership, poor positioning, um, but they Bad did orders. Away, at least for a little while. And then the British got further down the road and bumped <laughs> into uh, Joshua Barney and the flotilla uh, men and actually a, and a batch of U.S. Marines. So they're about, uh, I think it was like 400 or so of them up on this very low rise today i believe there's a popeyes there um the parking so lot a shopping center uh, kind of soak in the joshua barney vibes and they had all of their you know navy guns some of the heaviest artillery on the field these are like 12 pounders mostly i think they had at least one 18 pounder maybe there's an 18 yeah, yeah. and they're just blazing away at the british and they would have gone on longer except the guys with their supply wagons chickened out and started skedaddling all oh, i see wagons. what you did there and so they had no ammo to keep shooting at the British. So Barney ordered his men to flee and Barney himself was wounded. So he was ultimately captured by the British they actually treated fairly humanely. They dropped him off, I believe in a tavern and left him be on parole. So there you have it first on emerging war of 1812, George saying the Bladensburg races are more than just the races. Uh, there is a little bit of action, just a tiny little bit. All right, George is, is not going to go too far out on the limb, but there you have it. All right, so the British make their way into Washington, D.C., and what really starts the burning of Washington uh, as we know it today and as we call it, but uh, really it is more of a targeted burning on the part of the British than just them running rampant throughout the nation's capital, the nation's swamp, and burning uh, everything they see in sight. 
course, it's it's more targeted with the as you mentioned the White House and the Capitol building uh, as well. But uh, what what really kicks off the British uh, decision to burn some of these public buildings in the nation's capital? Well, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, George. Well, just very briefly, one burning public buildings when you took over another country's capital was not uncommon, despite what mm. I mean. The American press loved to put out. <laughs> Uh, that was pretty typical. Um, it was not a Hampton 2.0. It was much more controlled, as Kevin has mentioned. They did spare the patent office because it was a place of learning and science. So they're like, okay. Well, and there, there's some argument it was by accident because it wasn't actually signed as the pad, patent office. It was in a hotel building at the time. <laughs> so there, there, there is a, a ca some, something of a counterpoint that the British just didn't realize where the patent office was. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm sure there's a joke in there about staying at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> <laughs> now I have my new invention. Uh, but also, of course, you know, there's all the stuff about like um, York is often the American burning of York is often cited as um, British motivation for burning D.C. But there's also the burning of uh, Newark around Fort George in Canada, which they literally just turned families out in the snow and burned the buildings and then left. So they're just literally just family. There's no political significance to it. They're just families in a Canadian winter, which uh, Kevin up there in almost Canada or a native of almost Canada can certainly speak to. Uh, very cold. So the British are not too happy about that. Yeah, it's definitely, it's something that the British public and the, um, particularly the Canadian British public uh, are very much uh, in favor of. <laughs> it's, as George said, uh, the, the, at that point, uh, three years or so of, of fighting up on the Canadian border had definitely weighed much more heavily on the Canadian populace than it had on the Americans on the other side of the river. Not 100%, you know, one-sided one way or the other, but the, the Canadians had definitely uh, had the war a lot more in their front yards and hearts. So it was, it was very, I won't say popular, there was definitely uh, a little bit of, um, not the outrage and shock that Hampton had brought, because uh, this was much more of a, a controlled operation, but there was some shock that you know, uh, at the time when is they are the British are uh, are driving out a, a lot of Napoleon's holdings and retaking them, with without a whole lot of punishment to some of the more giant, minor German states and the like, that uh, they would turn around and then burn Washington. But yeah, by and large, the the British populace after again three years of reading these newspaper accounts of York and Fort George. And up and down the uh, the rivers of Canada, they were were kind of rooting for uh, the Americans to get back a little of their own medicine. Um, how much that impacted the actual decision to burn the capital? Uh, hard to say. I probably not much. Uh, I I think um, Coburn and and Ross had settled on that pretty far in advance that. Uh, it, it was an excellent uh, flaming torch of a message to the Americans that, hey, uh, you've been ignoring our efforts to, to try and convince you to defend your capital. So we're going to take your capital. Your, your capital rights have been revoked. Yeah. It's really, I mean, we got to blame the New Yorkers for uh, the British coming and burning stuff in uh, my backyard. So thanks, Kevin, uh, for your guys. I can. Uh, once again, uh, <laughs> But there's also, isn't there accounts of maybe potentially some um, pot shots being taken at the British too that kind of unleashed, I mean, the, the I hate to say the rules of warfare or the 19th century um, modes of how do you fight and, and so forth that um, allowed, uh, I know it's um, been picked up, I mean, by different historical uh, societies, organizations that have talked about it, but there was some shots supposedly directed toward um, a retinue of British officers that might have included uh, Roth himself um, and someone, a horse or something was hit. And that might have also triggered a little more about, okay, letting the men go slightly more. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the, the, of course, you know, DC, it's not really a major city at the time, but it does have a large populace. And as I mentioned, uh, the Virginia militiamen, they're not the only ones, the Georgetown, Alexandria, District of uh, District itself, Washington City companies. Uh, after Bladensburg, a lot of them have, have either shed uniforms or not and returned to the city. Uh, lurking around on the streets, I fully believe there was a, uh, a rifleman uh, or a, um, another, another militiaman who thought he might have a chance to uh, 
to make a contribution and, and fire off a shot at uh, a British staff officer, or maybe uh, enjoyed a little too much uh, 1812 revelry and uh, decided they'd take on the British army themselves. Um, or again, yeah, it could have been, you know, a, a brick or a tile fell off a building. Somebody thought they were getting shot at and suddenly uh, uh, unleash the troops into the streets. Very well played there, Nate. And I, I have to commend George as well for talking about American soldiers chickening out where there's now a Popeye's uh, back at Bladensburg. <laughs> but um, I'm gonna, uh, yes, there you go, George. George got it. Uh, I'm going to take us out of Washington now. We've got about 15 minutes left and we haven't quite even gotten to Baltimore yet. Um, Speed run Baltimore. So I know we've got, we got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, this is where Phil takes over the program, right, Phil? Uh, <laughs> but um, real quick, uh, British Admiral Alexander Cochran and Robert Ross are pretty much of the agreement to not go after Baltimore immediately, not to go after it right away. Instead, they want to go back up to Newport, Rhode Island, refit there, get their fleet ready for potentially a movement on either Baltimore, Charleston, South Carolina, or even New Orleans by that point. But our good friend George Coburn is able to talk both of them at least twist enough of their arms back into it to go after Baltimore uh, beginning on September 12th, 1814. So the defenses of Baltimore vastly different than the defensive preparations for Washington, D.C. Who wants to go ahead and tackle that? Sure, I mean, uh, George, you're on. Uh, George, I... or, or Phil, hey, whoever. Talking, go for it. Phil is the Marylander. Let's give it to him. No, I, um, so I found some uh, interesting. Uh, it's looking back at uh, Fort McHenry uh, and the formation. Um, I thought it was interesting that uh, 12, or 20 years before, Congress actually appropriated $4,225.44 to erect a 20 gun battery, and, um, which is obviously the formation of Fort McHenry. So um, for $4,000, you got the formation of what is now. Uh, the, probably one of the most recognizable fort names and uh, in uh, the, on the Eastern seaboard or probably in the United States. Um, obviously named for James McHenry, um, signer of the uh, Dec or US Constitution, a secretary of war. Um, it does uh, command obviously the, uh, the harbor uh, there coming into Baltimore. Um, it is uh, stocked with um, 18, 24 and 32 pounders. Um, it is a star shaped Fort, um, you cannot pass it. I mean, that's the that's the, the big thing going in, into Baltimore um, and so forth. Uh, and so, yeah, the uh, British um, have to do it. Now, there is obviously the land portion. Um, that's what I've studied a little more, uh, which would result in the Battle of North Point, because it is actually the first time one of my ancestors actually steps onto uh, the scene. It's the um, first, um, what is a green walk or descendant, I'm a descendant of a Baltimore militiaman that actually stayed and did not run away um, and actually fought at the battle at North Point, um, uh, which is, uh, of course, on the point between the Patapsco and, and Back River there, um, which actually results in, um, I don't know why I'm speeding up, but if we want to talk about more about Fort McHenry, let's talk about that. I know suddenly I feel rushed, like we got 11 minutes to get everything out um, quickly, but uh, before we move on to North Point, I'll pass it on to someone else about uh, Fort McHenry. There were rockets right over there. It was like I bombarded the big flag went up. We have a song. There you go. Yeah, I mean, we did talk about this, that actually the um, this wasn't going to be a focus on the writing of the uh, the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, yeah. We did mention that beforehand, but which is, of course, that could be a, a revelry of its own. Yeah. Um, I mean, really talking about that. But um, the, the, the American defenses definitely of Baltimore are much more sophisticated. Uh, they have trench lines on Hampstead Hill. Um as, as Phil mentioned, Fort McHenry is there. There are batteries, the Lazaretto batteries uh, near Fort McHenry also protecting the Patapsco River. Um, and so much, much better. And William Winder is basically out of the picture at this point. Samuel Smith uh, is instead in charge of most of the defenses of Baltimore. Um, he is a actually a Revolutionary War figure, uh, uh, well known for his performance at Fort Mifflin outside of Philadelphia on the Delaware River in 1777. Uh, and so things are going to go a little bit better for the Americans outside of Baltimore than they do outside of Washington. Uh, and Phil, as you mentioned, at the Battle of North Point uh, on the 12th. So we'll cover North Point real quick before getting to the naval battle uh, in the British Navy at McHenry. Um, but George, you want to give us a quick rundown of North Point? and give us the highlights really of what happens there. So the British are marching on uh, Baltimore. It's still hot, humid, and full of mosquitoes. Um, so now we've moved into September, which doesn't change much out in the mid-Atlantic. And 
you know, Sam Smith is, you know, preparing his main line of defense up on Baltimore. And of course, the city of Baltimore has seen what happened to D.C. So everyone's turning out to uh, help dig the trenches um, from all swaths of society, uh, free, enslaved, um, uh, rich, poor, didn't matter. They're all out there digging trenches. They're uh, taking up muskets They're And Sam Smith has on Hampstead Hill itself, at least uh, estimates tend to run about 10,000 soldiers. And that does not include the troops that are stationed west of the city, uh, south of the city, and at Fort McHenry. So he's got quite the force under his command, uh, but he's still trying to dig in and get everything into position. So he sends out a force to go try to slow down the British, which they do. Now, the British, technically, is it a British victory? Yes, they hold the field at the end, but the Americans have achieved their goal by the end of it. Um, most of the American troops do actually perform fairly well. There's not a single so far as I know, professional soldier on the field. They're all militia. Um, and they do give the British quite the bloody nose. And probably the most significant casualty from that is the death of Robert Ross. Um, he takes a, uh, uh, it's argued whether it's rifle ball or musket ball, but he gets shot and he dies. And now command is devolved onto uh, Colonel Arthur, I think it's Arthur Brooke, um, who then... Oh, yes. You know, yeah. so the Americans have delayed the British, who after that battle, you know, they can't quite the bloody nose, so they encamp and don't move on till the next day, which gives Smith more time to dig his entrenchments, which, um, you know, if you look at like Bunker Hill and a couple other places, apparently uh, we Americans have a knack for throwing up defensive works very quickly if you just give us just the right amount of hours. And so they get the British advance on Hampstead Hill, look up, Fort McHenry doesn't fall, and Brooke is kind of like, uh, yeah, I re I've heard stories of this Bunker Hill. It, no, we're not. No, we're we're going back. I'm not charging up that because you've got, like I said, 10,000 guys up there. Um, you have a larger number of Navy sailors. They actually have professionals and they've got their cannons with them. You've got the likes of like uh, Rogers, uh, Perry, uh, you know, these naval heroes who are up there with their cannons ready to beat the British bloody and the British turn around and head back to their ships. Good. So yes, you've, we've got the land side has been uh, decided for the Battle of Baltimore. The seaward side, or at least the riverward side, with the Patapsco River, the British Navy sailing up the Patapsco to bombard Fort McHenry uh, from two, initially two and a half miles away. And then, of course, I think uh, many of us know the story of Fort McHenry. But Phil, if you want to chime in and finish that off for us before we uh, conclude tonight's session and end with a couple of questions. Sure. Um, I mean, you have the better Armistead. Um, I think his nephew does something during a later war um, that gets him one of the. If you haven't seen the movie Gettysburg, you don't know about it. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> what do you do? He charges in, gets shot. Not all three of us, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, Henry, 25 hour bombardment. I mean, that uh, pummels uh, the fort, but it, it, it stands. I mean, um, I think the Americans uh, fire back intermittently. Um, one of the highlights of my Park Service career is actually being there at the uh, 200th anniversary, um, being assigned to the fort at 4.30 in the morning and thinking about what it was felt like um, to have that bombardment. But I mean, um, it is. Um, uh, the court or key goes out. I think it's a poem, what, a six stanza poem or something like that that he writes. Um, I mean, I don't know. Uh, George covered it pretty great with rockets, red glare, some uh, bomb. Just read the song. Air. Uh, Baltimoreans who like to see stuff sitting on their uh, rooftops watching what's going on. Um, but I mean, the, the casualties are um, I'm trying to get a bigger total over here, but the casualties are, are pretty light. If I uh, remember correctly, someone can fill in the details. I can, or go to Wikipedia, I guess, uh, find them out. But uh, other numbers escaped out of my head there. But yeah, I mean, it holds on. Uh, but uh, I feel like the war action is on the uh, landward side i mean when you when you can't subdue um the city uh port mchenry gets all the attention but it's really what happens as george explained in north point and, and hampton hill and, and so forth that really seals the fate um and uh they return so um and then we write a poem and then you can go visit it it's a national park uh it's got a great film new exhibits go for it so um there it is wrapped up 
Uh, I will also yeah. make one brief interjection before Kevin takes back over. But um, our last uh, War of 1812 veteran president is uh, is at Baltimore with the Pennsylvania militia or in the Baltimore area, James Buchanan, everybody's clear favorite American president <laughs> that no one has ever had any issues with <laughs> ever. Um, but yes, Buchanan is there on the field as a uh, member of a militia company from his home area. Very good. So with just a few minutes left, we do have a, a visitor question or a viewer question rather that I'm going to uh, bring up here in just a moment that I want you all to comment on. But uh, just to give me your wrap up thoughts, you know, studying and, and thinking about the Chesapeake campaign, I always find it quite interesting that, of course, you know, the, the American capital burns. Uh, as we talked about, it is a controlled burning, but you'd think this would be one of the worst days in American history. Um, and it's, it's pretty quickly overshadowed by the defense of Baltimore. And I always find it quite ironic. I know I'm far from the first person to point this out, that we get our national anthem, uh, a song that you hear on the radio every single day, every time you go to sporting events, you hear it, um, from a war that not a lot of people talk about uh, or think about. And I just find the Chesapeake campaign is, is two very interesting bookends in American history where you have an invading army burning the nation's capital. And then you get the song that we sing every time an American flag uh, is, is brought out onto a football field or a baseball field, anything like that, that comes from events that take place just about three weeks later. Um, so to you all, what is, sum it up real quick, what's the legacy of the Chesapeake campaign um, for you all and how it affects us as Americans, but then the War of 1812, the rest of the war as well? Phil the Marylander wants to chime in. Go I'll for chime it. I'm in. That way I'll give the two other esteemed gentlemen more chance to uh, come out with something uh, more higher or sophisticated. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, first of all, um, the co combine, I mean, I always feel like the War of 1812 is the conclusion of what has started in the American Revolution. I mean, even Washington, when he becomes president, says we can stay out of foreign entanglements and so forth for about 20 years. We'll be we're better. There's also lasting decisions on the British still being in, in what is the West or uh, on our Northern frontier. But it's also, I mean, we, we've shown through the American Revolution, the British march in and take Philadelphia, the colonial capital of the rebellion states. They've come in and taken DC. It really shows more that um, the difference of fighting in the Western hemisphere than uh, back in Europe, where, I mean, we had a comment, if you capture a capital in a European style conflict, it's checkmate. Um, but it's also too, I mean, you, um, the perseverance, I mean, of of the American, I mean, the Chesapeake, you have, I mean, the, the rating, which causes uh, what the third tier system of forts. Suddenly now we need to create these big forts everywhere and we need to solidify money. And it's still being constructed by the time of the Civil War. So you have that. But you also have, I mean, this uh, shining example of what's good and bad about the, um, the common American soldier from Bladensburg to North Point, what they can do, um, what on serving under and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, I think for me, the, I mean, growing up under the, in Baltimore um, and so forth, it's just, yeah, Fort McHenry was always, I mean, the Star Spangled Banner, but you kind of forget that uh, what it took um, to make that happen. But it's also a uh, change of when the United States really, I mean, afterwards steps out on more on the world scene, the Monroe Doctrine. And um, now that we're going to solidify ourselves, we've, we've kind of subdued the British twice and we've created a hero system. So the Chesapeake, yeah, is... Uh, sandwich because the War of 1812 doesn't have those, uh, I hate to say sexy characters, but doesn't have that big the shining outside of Andrew Jackson in Orleans, that one moment that you can rally around, but it has these tidbits that creates what is America moving forward. I think someone said we went from a change of terminology, the American uh, is to, or uh, of or is or something. There was a terminology that changed after the War of 1812 to kind of create a, a better feel. So that's that's my rambling. So I try to give enough time for Nathan and George to have something more elaborate. So uh, now, now Phil's putting the pressure on you two. We got to see something good here. I'm going to go a little more cultural. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with everything Phil said. But I think you know another thing I'll, I'll add in there is, you know, we as Americans since uh, almost day one, uh, July 4th, 1776, and even earlier, we love the plucky underdog. Now we love seeing ourselves as the plucky underdog. Even now, when we have like however many aircraft carriers it is and can project ourselves all over the world and are the most powerful country on earth, the United States is still the plucky underdog. And by God, we're going to keep being that. And then War of 1812 gives us more of that uh, stories to add to the plucky underdog story, uh, kind of 
plucky underdog mythos of the kind of the American militiamen beating off the forces of tyranny. And, you know, Baltimore especially very much plays into that with, you know, Fort McHenry, this, you know, powerful fleet, the largest Navy in the world, even though we're dealing with a very small portion of it, has bombarded our fort. They've marched their army. They've burned our capital, but we still fought on and we drove them back and we rebuilt and moved on. Um, you know, and I, you know, continues to play into, you know, the, this idea of the kind of the American underdog story. Nate, uh, so you got I'll, anything you'd like to add? And, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I, I think George and, and Phil have covered most of the big topics, but I, I would like to, to second that. I, I think probably the biggest thing to come out of the Chesapeake Bay campaign is that that symbolic um, triumph of, of the nation's capital in flames and then Baltimore, the victory at Baltimore very dramatically um, turns around. I think that's that's why, at least at the time, a lot of the American con public latch onto it very quickly. It's um, we, do, we like our underdog stories, but we also uh, don't like to dwell too much on our losses. Um, so it, it does very quickly back to back shows two sides of the American military system between its uh, failures and its victories and, uh, and what that can do for the public. One thing we didn't get a whole lot of chance to talk about because we didn't have a whole lot of, we only have an hour, <laughs> so uh, you can't talk about every single uh, raid and battle and fight. Uh, within the campaign, I would say it, it proves uh, how little both systems are capable of learning on the fly. Um, the British, uh, we, we've hit mostly on, on their victories, but St. Leonard's Creek, Coxfield, Craney Island, um, there, there's a number, the fight on the surveyor off uh, Gloucester Point, uh, there's a lot of, of victories uh, that the British win that should have given them an indication that this wasn't just going to be a walkaway victory, uh, but yet they, they still keep kind of carrying on like they were, and vice versa. There, there were a lot of fights that should have uh, encouraged the War Department and the government to sort of put more focus on funding their new regular regiments and improving and supplying the flotilla and Barney's men uh, and things like that. Uh, we briefly mentioned Fort Washington. Yeah, Fort Washington doesn't even fire a shot. Uh, they, their garrison panics, blows the fort up and retreats. Uh, so there definitely uh, was not a lot learned in the short term. Uh, in that campaign, but it that also very much cast the shadow of uh, how inflexible a lot of the military learning is the time that we're going to have to learn those lessons again in future wars. And but as I said, one thing we didn't really touch on very much, uh, it is it's another landmark kind of in the the worsening uh, situation of race relations in both Maryland and Virginia, and the district, uh, all slave holding areas, uh, the British, of course, as they had in the Revolutionary War, also encouraging uh, enslaved people to flee to them either for freedom, but also usually with the inducement of serving them as, as guides or scouts or in uniform military force. So it, it's another kind of benchmark as um, treatment for African slaves is going to get worse and worse over time, uh, partially because of this, this little, you know, two-year campaign that nobody thinks about in the future. Good. So where I want to end it tonight, um, obviously all of us are public historians in our day job. This is why we, we are doing what we do tonight. We love talking about this stuff. We love sharing it with the public. Uh, we had somebody comment that they grew up in the Washington, D.C. area uh, in the neighborhood and weren't really aware of many War of 1812 sites. And of course, a lot of what we've talked about today, some of those sites have been not so much wiped out by development, but at least made very hard to find with the exception of course of Fort McHenry uh, because of its preservation by the National Park Service. Um, and that is really the, the one site that if many people visit related to the War of 1812, that's probably the one uh, that they go to. But I do wanna leave it with uh, just one last question to you all. What is um, a couple of other sites with the exception of Fort McHenry and that's not to knock Fort McHenry, but that's just something that people know a lot about related to the Chesapeake campaign um, where people can go and visit and still see something, um, see not, you know, maybe a building that, that stood at any of these battlefields or just see a, a reminder of what took place in the Chesapeake Bay in 1813, 1814. I mean, we mentioned earlier the, uh, the fort that nothing happened at, uh, Fort War, uh, Washington. I mean, sits down there. Um, there is a, I uh, believe, I mean, there are, uh, there's a monument or so at uh, Bladensburg. I mean, uh, there are little things. Um, what I find interesting I mean, about growing up in the DC, um, 
the DMV or so, Metro is that um, there are, you can be walking down a street to find a historical sign or so forth. So um, if you're like if you're looking for the big open fields that are mostly Civil War battlefields, and I'm surprised we made it to 806. Actually, I'm sorry I didn't mention a Civil War guy uh, with uh, earlier on with Armistead, but we almost made it through. Um, you're not going to find that. I mean, in the uh, the area. I mean, obviously the population has expanded. DC has expanded. These sites on the outside of what is the outside of the city is now inside the city. Um, but yeah, there. I mean, there are monuments, Bladensburg. Um, there are historic signs at, at North Point. There is Fort Washington, which you can go visit a, a brick fort with. Um, I believe there's some things on the Eastern Shore uh, markers and so forth. Um, if we have a good friend, Drew Gruber, if he's listening, I know he does Civil War trails, but maybe he can do a War of 1812 trail marker system as well uh, that help help it out. But um, those are the first ones. Fort Washington is actually a national park site as well. Um, not disparaging, great site. I've worked with the staff there in a, in a previous spot in my career. So um, yeah, I'll pass it on. Actually, uh, so there is a state park at, you know, uh, Phil touched on this. There is a state park at North Point. Um, it is significantly smaller than the actual battlefield. It's only about, I believe, about an acre. But what they've done is just kind of shrunk the battlefield and then done the terrain on that single acre to scale of what it would have been kind of if you, they had the whole space. Because, like, I think where a good chunk of, like, the 5th Maryland was is now a subdivision. But they do – so basically they've just kind of shrunk the battlefield so you can get a nice overview of it. But you are on – and part of the battlefield and you can go learn about the battle over there so and that's not too far outside of baltimore of course patterson park is on hampstead hill they got some cannons up there and a couple signs talking about the defenses of baltimore so if you're in baltimore happen to be around the area want something to do after you've gone to see fort McHenry, or uh duck over there you know there, there's more 1812 history over there and a very important one for baltimore's history that was you know we talk about fort McHenry, but you know hampstead hill was the main line of defense and um, yeah, I'll, I'll chime in with um, a few smaller sites or ones that aren't necessarily terribly easy to visit. Uh, we didn't really talk about a whole lot about the Potomac, which are, is close to my workplace at Ripon Lodge Historic Site. But uh, down from Old Fort Washington, you have uh, at Fort Belvoir, the modern military installation, if you can get on the post, um, which I think is a little bit easier now that the museum is open there. Uh, that was the site of combined Navy and militia batteries uh, at White House Bluff. Um, Smallwood State Park in Maryland is near Indian Head, or it's on Indian Head, not really near where the batteries were, but I do believe they have some signage there um, for the naval batteries there that fought the British fleet in the Potomac. Uh, there is a National Park Service unit, uh, the Star Spangled Banner uh, National Historic mm -hmm. Trail. It's a mostly water trail, I think, but it has land sites all, all through Maryland and Virginia. Um, they have a website, they have a map, you can kind of follow along to some of those sites uh, that are not necessarily managed or parks. Um, but two I would mention would be uh, Cox Field, which is over on the eastern shore. Um, I'm bad with my Maryland counties. If you put in Cox Field, it'll, it'll show up online. But there's, there's a marker to the battle there, which was a victory uh, by the Maryland militia over the Royal Navy. And uh, it is way down in Dorchester County, Maryland, I believe. Uh, there's a marker at a little bit of a, a county park um, and some, I think, an artillery piece uh, marker at um, the Battle of Ice Mound, which is uh, kind of the, the Chesapeake Bay, New Orleans. Um, there's not a, not, not a whole lot of fighting, but some Maryland militiamen uh, capture the crews of two British uh, longboats that are stuck in the ice in February of 1815 uh, off that point. So there's a lot of sites dotted around. A lot of them are smaller, as George mentioned, uh, or are just markers or county parks or the like. But there are, they're out there, tucked away in different neighborhoods and uh, communities. Yeah, sadly, yes, you got to go out there. Just anymore. The uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers used it as a uh, dumping site, so the islands just kind of been filled in. It's yeah, it's Cranny Island's not really there, <laughs> yeah. but you can see Fort Norfolk and um, mm -hmm. the site of Fort Nelson down in, uh, in Norfolk. So there is plenty to see. Uh, obviously, we had plenty to talk about. We were discussing this for an hour and ten minutes, and we did not even come close to touching on everything. Uh, Sorry. There's a lot going on in the Chesapeake. That's not anybody's fault. There's a lot <laughs> going on in the Chesapeake from 1813 through 1814 and even uh, in, into 1815. 
so stay tuned for more of these. I think we'll we'll try to, you know, again, have the War of 1812 slowly creeping more in uh, to these revelries, and we'll bring back some other guests to talk about, and you all too, you all did a fine job, of um, some other topics related to the War of 1812. But I will say just before we sign off, um, again, Sunday, June 13th at 7 p.m. will be our next Rev War Revelry. Going back to the Rev War, we'll have uh, author Jack Kelly and his new book about Valcor Island. And then also another uh, upcoming Emerging Revolutionary War event, uh, Friday, November 12th to Sunday, November 14th is the first ERW bus tour. Uh, and then it will be focus on the battles of Trenton and Princeton uh, up in New Jersey. So if you are interested in that, Follow us on Facebook, again, at Emerging Revolutionary War, or online as well at EmergingRevolutionaryWar.org. So Nate and George and Phil, thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening, shedding a little bit more light on the war in the Chesapeake, and we'll hope to see you back on here again soon to talk more about emerging uh, the, the War of 1812 on Emerging War of 1812 uh, here <laughs> as we slowly take over. So thank you all again for tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed, and stay tuned for more uh, Rev War revelries coming up in the next few weeks. <laughs>